Philosophy Institution. And I'm also the uh, co-director of the Anares Project for Alternative Futures, which is one of the uh, sponsors of today's talk along with a generous contribution from the Hunter Foundation for Religion and Culture. So uh, on behalf of the Hunter and on behalf of Anares, I want to welcome you uh, to uh, our talk today uh, with uh, Nathan Schneider. Uh, and so let me talk a little bit about what Anares is about. So some of you uh, may know this term, the Anares Project uh, uh, for Alternative Futures. Uh, we take our uh, inspiration from the speculative science fiction of uh, Oregon writer Ursula K. Le Guin, who was here at OSU just last weekend. Uh, the Anares Project uh, is meant to be a forum uh, at OSU for uh, creative discussions around ending domination, war, oppression, uh, and inequalities in various forms, uh, racially, uh, gender-wise, sexually, and so forth. And so we're very uh, uh, interested in the social movements to try to uh, end these forms of social inequity in the world and try to have various discussions on campus that uh, bring social movement, uh, social change leaders to help us understand uh, the kinds of things that are needed to be done in the world uh, to bring about change and to try to bring a better sort of social utopia as the best we can sort of imagine that to uh, uh, the world. So uh, in that spirit, we were very excited when we heard that Nathan Schneider was going to be coming to campus uh, and talking for the Hunter Foundation. So just as a sort of promo, uh, Nathan's given actually two talks today. One is the talk today uh, uh, in just a few minutes. He's also going to be speaking here this evening as well um, in this same room. Uh, and the topic will be, uh, why does the world need religious studies? And so it's an interesting discussion. Uh, uh, and we'll see some connections as well today from, to, from our talk today to the discussion this evening. But just to remind you that he will be uh, here talking at 7 p.m. this evening. So uh, as a way of background, I'll let Nathan talk a little bit about himself and the work that he does, but uh, this is uh, the book that he published uh, uh, last year, which are his uh, ideas and reflections on the organizing that took place at Zuccotti Park uh, Freedom uh, Plaza in, uh, uh, in uh, New York City starting in 2011. Thank you, Anarchy. And the, the book is a collection of his writings that he was uh, reporting on uh, the goings on on Occupy Wall Street for Harper's, for The Nation magazine, and other publications on the Post and so forth. And so he's collected those together into this book, which begins with uh, the origins of the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, in uh, early summer 2011 and the uh, processes by which organizers were coming together to envision what might happen. And it's a very sort of interesting real life perspective on the kind of, uh, on one hand, sort of social anarchy that was taking place of how sort of really chaotic and wonderful the organizing was in that uh, summer of 2011 to get things underway. But the talk today is focused specifically on the question about anarchism as a political philosophy or as a way of thinking, a way of organizing, and how that influenced what was going on with Occupy Wall Street. And one of the things that's really interesting from my perspective in uh, his book is a discussion in ways in which the ideas of anarchist political philosophy influenced a lot of the ways in which uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement organized itself uh, and developed various kinds of techniques and tactics uh, and technologies for trying to create a what folks call a horizontal or egalitarian form of social movement. That's really something that uh, is, has glimmers in the past, right? There are sort of uh, historical uh, uh, groups that try to really be committed to this kind of social egalitarianism in terms of leadership and authority and organizing, but not many. And uh, what's interesting is to see the ways in which Occupy Wall Street made it a point to be committed to these kinds of, uh, of techniques. And what uh, Nathan does really interestingly is to show how uh, anarchism as a political philosophy was behind a lot of the way in which that organization took place. And so um, uh, Nathan is also uh, the author of uh, God and Proof, the story of a search from the ancients uh, uh, to the internet that was published by University of California Press in 2013. And so that's going to be the basis of this discussion this evening. 
Uh, hopefully, we'll also talk about uh, Occupy Catholicism, right, which was the working group that he created, uh, or helped to create uh, at Occupy Wall Street. Uh, and so uh, he is one of the founders of a really fantastic website that has been in existence for many years now. It's been helpful for organizing and thinking about social change called Waging Nonviolence. So we need to know that. Uh, and so uh, I want you to help me to welcome uh, Nathan Schneider to uh, Oregon State University. Thank you, sir. Can you say something to our viewers? Ah, right. So this is just an aside from the public. Close your ears. Uh, students who are in our community organizing class, please hold on to your assignments and uh, we'll turn them in at the end of class. Uh, at the end of the day, right. But start thinking of the questions you're going to ask. <laughs> so step back into the presenter mode. Uh, please let us uh, welcome the entire to us. Movement 
with a sense of, of one thing that they thought was really wrong, right, with, with, uh, uh, with what we're working with here. Um, maybe it was uh, Citizens United, this Supreme Court decision, and it really screwed things up. Or maybe it was uh, some aspect of financial law or regulation or something. But in the course of them, in their encounters with, the, uh, with other people, and then they came to recognize much more deeply um, the ways in which um, economic inequality, social inequality, political, um, a lack of access to political decision making really affects people um, uh, along racial lines, along lines of gender, uh, uh, class, things that sometimes our society lets to pretend aren't there. Those came out very much in, this, in the course of this movement and were revealing for a great many people. At the same time, there was also an apocalypse of uh, a capacity, of ability, of agency, a sense of, of unveiling about what uh, politics even means and what kind of participation in it we as human beings might have. A lot of people who became deeply involved in the Occupy movement came of age politically uh, around the time of President Obama's first election. Maybe they were knocking on doors. Maybe they were uh, trying to agitate their fellow students and get them uh, into the voting booths. Um, maybe they were excited by the promise of change and hope. But so many of those people in the years after the election um, felt a sense of disappointment, a sense of frustration, or maybe a sense of recognition of the limits of just that kind of politics, the kind of politics that's on the political page in the newspaper, um, the doings of elected officials and the questions of whether or not they're going to be elected next time. And through this movement, they came in contact often for the first time with another tradition of politics, another political tradition, uh, that we have, one of direct action, and of grassroots organizing, of, of um, building performance and spectacle in public, creating assemblies, having open discussions with fellow citizens, and building power together. And that was an incredible uh, revelation for many people that sent them in all, all sorts of different directions. And that left them, uh, left many people um, asking themselves the question after this Occupy phenomenon began to uh, dissolve away of what they would do next. For me, uh, this reporting started in the uh, summer of 2011. And this was, remember, a really interesting moment. It was after the, the Arab Spring had taken off uh, there had been this uprising in, in Wisconsin. Um, there was a lot of interest in popular movements. You know, I really edited, was, you know, for years before I'd been editing a website about popular movements, um, and people used to ask, like, why would you bother doing that? They're irrelevant. Um, suddenly that year, there was a there was a sense of fresh and uh, urgent interest in what popular movements could achieve. And I was meeting with people who were involved in these movements from around the world and seeing the drama of their planning processes, which wasn't really in the news at all. You know, we saw the, the protests in the street, we saw the clashes with police, but we didn't so much see the stories of, of where these came from. And those struck me as really empowering uh, stories, stories that I wanted to learn how to tell. Um, and so I started looking out for people doing that kind of planning and strategizing in the United States, closer to home. And uh, uh, by uh, June and July of 2011, I was amazed at what I found. Already by then, there were several groups of people who were planning uh, uh, something like a mass demonstration in a public space in the United States of America. The first one that I found was a group of mostly older activists, including a lot of uh, military veterans, who were planning an occupation at Freedom Plaza in Washington, D.C. that would begin in, um, in October. There was another group associated with the uh, online network Anonymous uh, that was planning actually to occupy Zuccotti Park, the same place where I was in June. 
that didn't work out so well. But some of those people later became folded into this other process that I soon discovered um, Occupy Wall Street. And this was the initial call. This is where it began. There was a centerfold in a kind of art activism magazine called Adbusters. And this was pretty much all the Adbusters people did. They put out a poster. They sent it to their emails. They tweeted a little bit about it. Um, and then pretty much sat on their hands. It says, what is our one demand? A ballerina on, this is a sculpture that, um, that's in the Wall Street area in New York City. Some right is in the background. Hashtag Occupy Wall Street. September 17th, <coughs> the birthday of the mother of the editor of Bad Busters. And bring pen. So in early August, um, having heard that this had been called for, I found myself in this group. And I'm kind of like in the back there. Um, that's the mood of anthropologist Amy Graver. Lots of other people here really just spend a lot of time on, on uh, national news for various, uh, for various reasons. But this was a group of people, many of whom didn't know each other or were just meeting each other. Uh, who came together uh, 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 with the hope of somehow responding to this call that Adbusters had made. Uh, something inspired them about it. This was this kind of like the New York anarchist community a little bit here. There's kind of a student group here. Uh, she's part of the little Rouge group, you know, kind of fringe, kind of right-leaning. Um, group. She's a, a professor and labor organizer. This is a group from, uh, from South Dakota. Um, an interesting kind of hodgepodge. Um, and over the course of these meetings, I got to see a very interesting and tumultuous planning process uh, take place. So a few features of that one demand, uh, or of this poster, of this call, began to shift. So September 17th, well, they couldn't really do anything about that. Um, before too long, um, the hashtag got dropped, uh, the Occupy Space Wall Space Street, but that took a few weeks to really figure out how you were going to write this. Um, uh, bring tent, well, some investigation and experience with New York City uh, 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 police practices uh, made it seem like maybe bringing tent wasn't the best idea at first because it would just make you Target, so, so they started sending out messages saying, don't bring tent. <laughs> um, and then that question, which was probably the most uh, widely debated um, uh, over the course of the movement, what is our one demand? That started shifting over the course of these meetings. People came and realized, they, they came often with some idea of what a demand should be. Maybe some kind of financial regulation, maybe some kind of political modification of an amendment to the Constitution or something. But through these conversations, the strategy shifted. And by the way, strategy shifted in this very similar way among the older group um, uh, who was planning to occupy uh, uh, Freedom Plaza in DC totally independently. And in different ways, but the conversation shifted um, in a similar direction. They started to recognize that they didn't really have, they weren't really in a position yet to make one demand. They didn't have a movement. They didn't have the power to make that demand heard. And so what they decided was a kind of more anarchic term. They weren't going to focus on what the government would or wouldn't do in response to the demand. They were going to focus on building their movement, on, uh, on, 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 on calling people to rise up in their communities. Rather than just Occupy Wall Street, they started talking about stuff like Occupy Every Street, Occupy Your Neighborhood, build an assembly in your community, and, um, and let's get, and, and start talking about what the, uh, the concerns and, uh, and the crises are for you. How is Wall Street manifesting itself in your community? And so soon, uh, what we saw was not one demand, 
but many calls, many, uh, there was a document called The Principles of Solidarity that was released very early. And in all this debate about, oh, the, the Occupy movement doesn't have any demands, very few reporters noticed, bothered to look at these documents that actually were being passed by the General Assembly, the principles of solidarity, the kind of world that they wanted to create, which incidentally uh, bears no small resemblance to uh, to the one or solo would imagine that this possessed. Um, uh, and then also a declaration was released, the things that are wrong, and corporate personhood, these sorts of things, right? Uh, positive and negative statements, um, uh, uh, principles, beliefs, commitments, but not necessarily demands. And it was upon those that the movement really built, built itself, developed its energy, became a place where um, in New York City and in cities all around the country, people poured their creative energy because it was a self-supporting community, it was kind of existing for its own sake. Uh, uh, people wanted to support it, they wanted to build it, they wanted to have a hand in making it. And so uh, they built a library. Uh, uh, within, the, within the first day, books started appearing in the place where they would all, and then soon there was, there was a library with thousands of, of um, books. There was a newspaper, a print newspaper too, uh, really interesting the world of print and a very digital movement. Um, there was food being served all day. There were all of these committees to serve every need. Um, and, uh, and, and people were trying to model the kind of society that they wanted to see in this very kind of scrappy and self-made way. And it was that, I think, that ex the experience of being in a place like that that brought so many people in. And then, at least at the beginning, <coughs> Uh, made it continue to grow uh, amidst the, the, uh, the violence coming from the police that you see here with the cop walking over the signs with the, the, um, the ubiquitous plastic handcuffs. You know, here's, a, here's another list of, of, uh, of demand. People would often come in with their own lists of demands uh, and try to get everyone to to, to agree to that, uh, but you know, for a lot of people, it just felt like that that political exercise of demanding something of the political system um, didn't make sense at that point. At that point, and when there were when there were things that the movement felt people in the movement felt like they could accomplish, actually, there was no problem about making demands. For instance, when they got involved in a labor dispute uh, uh, with Teamsters and and. Uh, who were art handlers and as for Sotheby's. Uh, they were very comfortable making demands of, uh, on behalf of and in solidarity with the workers. Uh, and they won. But there was a sense that, you know, why bother making a demand of, of a system that uh, is not going to listen to them anyway. In the meantime, let's build our own movement on our own terms um, and uh, demands will come. <coughs> so, um, before I finish, uh, just to kind of draw out some of the issues about uh, anarchism, I, I hope you don't mind me reading um, a couple of pages from, um, this is not actually from an Thank You Anarchy book, um, it's from an introduction I did to, uh, to a collection of, of um, Noam Chomsky's writings on anarchism, and, um, and it's kind of comes out of the moment of the wake of, of, uh, of Oscar Wall Street. And this is a picture from the, from the, uh, uh, from the local New York newspaper. Uh, I think this was the one year anniversary. The first evening of a solidarity bus tour in the West Bank, I listened as a contingent of college students from around the United States made an excellent discovery. They were all, at least kind of, anarchists. As they sat on stuffed chairs in the lobby of a lonely hotel near the refugee camp, refugee camp in war ravaged Janine, they probed one another's political tendencies, which were reflected in their ways of dressing and their most recent tattoos. 
All of this, along with stories of past trauma, made their way out into the light over the course of our 10-day trip. I think I would call myself an anarchist, one admitted. Then another jumped into the space this created. Yeah, totally. Basic agreement about various ideologies and idioms ensued. Ableism, gender queerness, Zapatistas, black blocks, orders. The students took their near unison as an almost incalculable coincidence, though it was no such thing. This was the fall of 2012, just, one, just after the one year anniversary of Occupy Wall Street. A new generation of radicals had experienced a moment in the limelight and a sense of possibility and had little clear idea about what to do next. They had participated in an uprising that aspired to organize horizontally, that refused to address its demands of the proper authority, and that, like other concurrent movements around the world, prided itself on the absence of particular leaders. One couldn't call the Occupy movement an anarchist phenomenon per se, though some of its originators were self-conscious and articulate anarchists. Most who took part wouldn't describe their objectives that way. Still, the mode of being that Occupy uh, swept so many people into with its temporary autonomous zones and public squares, never, nevertheless left them feeling, as it was sometimes said, anarcho-curious. The, the, the generation most activated by Occupy is one for which the Cold War means everything and nothing. We came to consciousness in a world where communism was a doomed proposition from the get-go, vanquished by our Reagan-esque grandfathers and manifestly genocidal to boot. Capitalism won fair and square. Market forces work. A vaguer kind of socialism, such as what furnished the functional train systems that carried some of us on backpacking trips across Europe, still held, still held some appeal. Yet the word socialism had been so thoroughly tarnished in the hegemonic sound bites of Fox News as to be obviously unusable to it. It's also the word Fox associates with Barack Obama, whom this generation's door knocking helped elect, but whose administration strengthened the corporate oligarchy, waged unaccountable robot wars, and imprisoned migrant workers and, and heroic whistleblowers of every place. <coughs> so much for socialism. Anarchism, then, is a corner backed into rather than a conscious choice, an apathetic last resort, and a fruitful. It permits being political outside the red and blue confines of what is normally referred to as politics in the United States, without being doomed to a major party's inevitable betrayal. We can affirm the values we've learned on the internet, transparency, crowdsourcing, freedom to, freedom from. We can be ourselves. Anarchy is the political blank slate of the early 21st century. It is shorthand for an eternal now, for a chance to restart the clock. Nowhere is this more evident than an anarchic online collective anonymous, whose only qualification for membership is having effaced one's identity, history, origins, and responsibility. This anarchist amnesia that has overtaken radical politics in the United States is a reflection of the amnesia in US politics generally. With the exception of a few shared mythologies about our founding slaveholders and our most murderous wars, we like to imagine that everything we do is being done for the very first time. Such amnesia can be useful because it lends a sense of pioneering vitality to our undertakings that the rest of the history-heavy world seems to envy. But it also condemns us to forever reinvent the wheel. And this means missing out on what makes anarchism worth taking seriously in the end. The prospect of learning over the course of generations how to build a well-organized free society. Our capacity to forget is astonishing. In 1999, a horizontal spokes council, uh, so a form of egalitarian uh, organizing, uh, 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 mobilized the protests that helped shut down the World Trade Organization meeting in Seattle. Just over a decade later, a critical mass of Occupy Wall Street participants considered such a decision-making structure, this uh, spokes council, an illegitimate and intolerably reformist innovation. Despite whatever extent to which we have ourselves to blame for this amnesia, however, it has also been imposed upon us. 
who repression against the threat anarchism was once perceived to pose. Remember that an American president was killed by an anarchist, and another anarchist assassination set off World War I. There are still unmarked gashes on buildings along Wall Street left over from anarchist bombs. More usefully, and actually more dangerously, anarchists used to travel across the country teaching industrial workers how to organize themselves and demand a fair share from their robber baron bosses. Thus, the official questionnaire at Ellis Island sought to single out anarchists coming from Europe. Thus, Italian anarchists Sacco and Benzetti were martyred in 1927 and roving grand juries in prison anarchists without a charge today. Thus, we see liberal sleights of hand, such as the one described in chapter three of this book, uh, by which the anarchist popular revolution underway during the Spanish Civil War is definitely erased from history. Anarchism's slate is really anything but blank. And I'd just like to conclude um, before we open this up, with a bit of a reflection on where things stand now um, with thought and, and um, with these ideas. Um, I found it useful to consider the movement in light of, um, of this kind of eight-step program developed by social movement theorist and activist Bill Moyer in the 70s and 80s. Um, it doesn't fit up, I think, really. <coughs> Uh, for those who are who uh, studying post the will recognize that. But um, there are a few ways in which it kind of captures the phenomenological experiences. It starts out with this with this anarchic first, this this moment where everything's running on um, on, on uh, <coughs> uh, adrenaline and uh, uh, borrowed energy, uh, and then that moment inevitably collapses and. What follows, maybe a few steps later, is what Moyers called step five out of eight. And this, is, this was actually the most important one, the most interesting one for him. He called it the perception of failure. It's this moment where he would find activists who just accomplished something really amazing would find themselves feeling like they had completely failed. And he developed this whole framework, actually, in order to help those activists think through what might come next. But I think this fits the Occupy movement really well. And it does pose the question of whether what it is experiencing now is an actual failure, which is often what we hear in the media now, whenever the movement comes up in one way or another, or whether it's a mere perception. I mean, if you had told me when I was sitting in uh, this meeting uh, more than two years ago that I'd still be talking about this movement to an audience this big, I would have been shocked. You know, the effect of this movement compared to, um, to, to similar, to, to, to the record of social justice movements over the previous decade and its ability to capture people's imaginations, to capture the media attention. Uh, was astonishing. Actually, uh, I'm almost sure you don't know this, but uh, about 20,000 people led by unions and structures and organizations and all sorts of good formal organizing marched on Wall Street uh, on May 12, 2011. Who knew, right? Um, and there's something about this phenomenon, this energy that came out from these mostly young people um, who many of whom imagined what they were doing, that they were doing something for the first time. Uh, 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 something about that worked in a way that uh, the, the Union March did. Still, it implanted in people a sense of a utopia, a sense of possibility, a sense of a better world that did leave them feeling disappointed. The success was in conveying that sense, that sense of possibility. But the failure was in, was in realizing it and meeting their heightened expectations of what the world would be. And so the question that remains for many of the people who were closely involved is what to do next. In many cases, they've gone on 
into, uh, into various issue-based uh, organizing projects, especially trying to work in ways so that people who are most affected and most vulnerable in our society are in the lead um, in what they're doing and where tangible gains uh, can be won. But that means people are spread out and aren't sharing a common narrative and aren't sharing a common hashtag. Right? And, uh, and it remains to be seen, I think, whether that perception of failure turns into a real failure and we continue to let politics uh, be ruled by the kind of narrow kind of stuff that fits onto the, onto the politics page or whether our society as a whole is able to take up the call that this movement uh, and so many other movements uh, make to really build power from the ground up, to redefine politics for ourselves, to reclaim our history and our sense uh, of our own capacity uh, to self-govern um, and, uh, and to build uh, a society that we can be proud of. So I hope this is uh, a useful way to start a conversation. And um, I thank you for, for listening. And I look forward to hearing from your experience uh, and your reflections.